All right, folks, we're up for another edition of The Big Picture here. We're taking a step back from your Twitter feeds and all of the news that's been bothering you to look at things that can actually help you navigate your way through life. People think they know where their money is going. Spending, if you don't know where your money is going, John Allen, we can't have a discussion. Investing in your food is investment in yourself and, mm. and for me now that I'm um, cooking now and posting my videos, it's also investing in my craft. The government has opted not to reduce its own expenditure. It's going for the route of raise your revenues. Mm. Tax. Content creators. Yeah. That 5% tax, yeah. so it's going to be increased. So that would mean we have to adjust our rate cards to accommodate that 15%. What then is the solution? We must deal with the biggest outflow of our tax revenue, which is the debt. The Shakahola cult deaths continue to unravel like a horror movie. How did we not realize this? Men will hardly ever come out and talk about being sexually assaulted. Men who have been gang raped by women. That fear of not knowing yeah. what next is something that has been built up over years. If you're doing this for other people, you'll never be satisfied. What was the most surprising or shocking thing that you watched on the show and you were like, I love you? So when you read the finance bill for 2023, it comes against a background of, first of all, um, just a sort of recovery from COVID. Mm -hmm. I say sort of recovery because COVID uh, seems to have just been, uh, you know, almost like that last nail mm -hmm. on a coffin uh, of economies that were already shaky because already debt ridden, debt did not increase because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, our analysis shows that actually the trend is almost the same as before COVID. Um, uh, economies are already reaching certain limits in terms of how much they, they, they are able to create employment at the current level of growth. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, so that's the first context. The second context is also against the context of a government that comes in and says, hey guys, we are aware of the kind of situation Kenyans are in we are going to cut our expenditure by mm. 300 billion. Then they don't cut their own expenditure by 300 billion. If anything, their budget seems to be going up. Mm. We are waiting for the second supplementary, uh, <coughs> which should be coming, uh, who knows, any time from now. Uh, but the fact is that the numbers actually have gone up. Yeah. The last time we checked, I think it's gone up by about 12, 13 billion. Uh, mm. Or uh, sorry, what was able to be cut then was just about 11, 12 billion. Yeah. Um, so, so, then thirdly is then what you see being provided for yeah there are a couple of things uh, uh that uh for me strike one is taxes that have got a across the board mm. kind of effect a good one is the increment of 16 percent on petroleum and petroleum products mm. remember this was raised to eight percent yeah uh, in the previous uh, and it raised a lot of storm mm. uh what that does is that uh <clears throat> you know it it inevitably mm -hmm. affects the cost of doing business for um, everybody for everybody mm. and, and it's a regressive tax if you think about it yeah. because i who perhaps could be having an income of x amount of money you know somebody having an income of a thousand shillings mm. and one having an income of a hundred shillings are both going to be paying the same amount of tax for whatever yeah. But also it's just the replica effect it has on transport, mm. on production, on movement of goods and services mm. across 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 board. Even you know tangentially on the cost of food, for instance. Cost of food, yes. Yeah. Uh, then uh, you have uh, so so that that's that, that that's 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 a big one mm. uh, in in my opinion. The housing levy um, is interesting because in the first place, I don't think it needs to be in the finance bill. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because this is a provision for a service that is not expected to be consumed by every Kenyan. Mm -hmm. You cannot say housing houses for certain people who are supposed to, to, to benefit yeah. uh, is the same as a road. Mm -hmm. See a road everybody uses. Yeah. Everybody will use it. But a house is just be me who will be living, will in, be it. living in it. Yeah. Two, the target the targeted 
category of people of beneficiaries mm. is not the targeted group of people for payment. Mm. So the target of payment is for salaried Kenyans, yeah. but the implied beneficiaries are unsalaried Kenyans, mm -hmm. if, if the words of the president uh, is anything to go by. Yeah. So I feel it's a distraction, in my opinion, mm. uh, because then you have other taxes uh, you know, that have been, for instance, incrementing transaction costs mm. uh, for mobile, 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 mobile services. Today, our debt ceiling is 10 trillion shillings. We are sitting north of 9.3 trillion shillings. To do 200,000 houses a year, even if you multiply that by, say, average of 3 million, that is 600 million. So if we are going to fund this program from the exchequer, I need 600 billion every year. Okay? Where am I going to get that money from? I'll tax you. Because today I don't have that revenue. So the alternative is for me to come and tax or I go borrow. Where the ceiling is sitting at 10 billion and I'm already maxing the, 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 the room and I already have a deficit this year that I need to fund, is borrowing an option. It is not an option. But yet, you put me into government to sort out your problems. Because I told you this is my plan. The president went around town halls everywhere selling the plan. And you listened to them and you said, I like this plan. And I'm going to vote for you. So we, in our wisdom, sat down and said, we have a big challenge. As I said, 30,000 versus 50 million. Okay. The market coming up, 50,000 versus 1,000. So what did we say? Is there another innovative way of funding this agenda without having to tax Kenyans? Without having to uh, bankrupt ourselves with more debt? Okay? And that's why we came up with the idea of the housing fund, which is well researched. So how does our housing fund work? The housing fund, essentially, it is your money. It is not a tax. The contribution, the mandatory contribution is your money. Let me explain to you the difference. The difference of a saving or under the housing fund and tax is today you're paying taxes, isn't it? Whether it is direct taxes, whether it is VAT, whether it is fuel levy because you're driving around, you're paying taxes. Those taxes do not confer you a direct benefit. Did you know that? Because your taxes today have been used to build a road in Moyale. Have you been to Moyale? You've never been to Moyale? Exactly. It, it, probably <laughs> Lunga Lunga in uh, Kwale. Yeah. You're like, where is that? Okay? But your money has been used to build a road there. So it means taxes does not give you a direct benefit. It gives you an expectation that you're going to do something. You're going to build roads. But it may not be the road where I am. In fact, I could be the biggest contributor but you actually don't build the roads where the biggest contributor is coming from. It's important to understand that. Then when you come to the housing fund, we said, how do I still make it? It has the form of a tax because it's mandatory, okay? But I confer you a direct benefit. That's why we came up with a 3% for employ uh, 3 employer employee, but it is capped at 2,500 shillings. Okay? Yeah. That contribution is yours. Why? Because you can either get a house from that benefit, you can use it to pay a deposit, and I can finance you then in a cheap way to continue paying and own a home. Two, you can get that money out in various forms. If you die, the money is paid out. If you retire, the money is paid out. After seven years, you can bequeath, you can remove it, you can transfer it to your pension, you can transfer it to your kid, you can transfer it to your house help, you can transfer it to your gardener, it is your money. Yeah. Are you able to do that with your tax? You know, 10 years, you see, you can't. So, I hope I have been able to set the scene as to what we are solving for. That money, what are we using it for? Kenyans understand the principle of circles understand the principles of Chama. We, you bring money together and you have a common interest group. Maybe you are teachers, maybe you are journalists or whatever it is. You come together and say, hey, colleagues, let's come together. We start saving. Why? Because we need to buy land so we can build our own homes. 
so that we can borrow, you can lend money to each other, we buy a car and so on and so forth, all right? The National Housing Development Fund is similar structure. It is like a big national chama. The only thing is, we are saying it is mandatory for those that have a pay slip. Why? Because one of the goals, UN goals, is something which is called shared prosperity. We can't talk about shared prosperity as a country when 6.5 million people are living in informal settlements and are paying 172% for water and are using flying toilets. So shared prosperity means let's, we put our money together, okay, and we start solving our issues together. So what does the housing fund do? Very important. Housing fund pools money. I said the maximum is 2,500. Yeah. That is the highest paid person will pay is 2,500. Average Kenyans, you know 75% of all formal employees earn 50,000 and below. So they will only contribute 1,500 and 1,000. So you contribute 1,000, but the collective money, you understand the Chama thing? We have now a big pot of money. You don't, we don't need to borrow all of us at the same time, isn't it? We have our own rules, yeah? So some of us start to get homes, but how do we uh, operationalize this fund? Yeah. The money comes together into this pot. Our estimate is we get about nine billion a month. Okay? Yeah. By our estimates. You know, based on the number of uh, formal employees, about three billion. Nine billion a month. What do we do with it? And it is not government money. It is not coming to treasury. That money in the treasury will never see. If, for example, now we have uh, fuel or dollars or whatever it is, we say, hey, can we borrow money from here so that we go and pay pending bills or we subsidize so that the dollar... That is members' money. It is not government money. It never hits the consolidated fund. It will never come to the consolidated fund. Right? So we should not be paying debt. Now I say this because this is the biggest problem we are facing on the government account. Yeah. Now, I, I, I like to repeat this in very simple terms. Mm -hmm. If you were earning uh, uh, 100,000 shillings and you went to ask for a bank loan that is more than 30,000 shillings, yeah. right? On the basis of revenue mm -hmm. of 100,000 shillings, the bank would tell you that is the maximum. 30% mm -hmm. of your revenue to, pay, to take as a debt, that's your maximum. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you take more than that, you're going to have to find a way of borrowing yeah. somewhere else to meet your lifestyle. Mm. A country is very similar. Well, similar to the extent that, you know, th those, those terms do apply, but countries are different in that. You can extend the term of the loan. No, no, countries, no, no. Yeah. It is a question of revenue. Mm -hmm. How much of your revenue yeah. is going to pay debt? That is the crunk. Mm. Right? Never forget that yardage. If we were at 18% of our revenue, mm -hmm. 18 shillings of every 100 going to pay debt. With you. And we pass 30. Mm. You enter immediately in economic terms what is called a debt trap. Mm -hmm. All right? You need more and more money to service your debt and your operations. Mm -hmm. That is why we have been increasing. So by this argument, then Kenya got into a debt trap in 2015 when, you know, the, the, I think the debt to GDP ratio was, I think it was 48% thereabouts, right? So just over that 30% of No, the, I, yeah. I, I don't like to use the debt, debt mm. to GDP ratio mm. because it's, a, you know, look at America's debt, debt to GDP ratio, yeah. right? I can't remember the figure, but I know it's, 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 it's more than even ours. Mm. But if you look at the repayment of debt, mm. debt servicing ratio, yeah. it is only 13%. And you can see the kind of wars you are seeing in Congress mm. over raising the debt ceiling. And there are 13% of their revenue going to pay debt. Yeah. In fact, it's one of the things I intend to present to Parliament mm -hmm. on this debate of the debt ceiling, right? And debt being anchored to GDP. Mm. I would like to see debt being anchored to our revenue mm. servicing capacity. Mm. So when you pass 30%, we pass that, I agree, around 2015 yeah. or so. 2015, yeah. Right? Now, when you pass that, you enter debt trap. You need more and more debt to service your mm -hmm. life. This is why we are where we are, mm -hmm. principally. The second 
is that we've also had a big drop in the in the shilling. Yeah. Right? And if you take our debt stock, especially in dollars, mm. remember we have to raise shillings to pay, to pay for those debts. dollars. Yeah. We've estimated of late that with the current foreign debt stock, mm. every shilling we drop is between 38 and 40 billion shilling increase in our debt, mm. which is a very frightening figure. Mm -hmm. We are dropping almost a shilling every week, every two weeks. Yeah. Right? It's now 140 something. It's 141 as we speak. It is the most, it right. is very frightening. Yeah. Just the other day it was 120. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at that and saying we're headed towards just on depreciation of the shilling, mm -hmm. an increase in debt of another 1 trillion, mm -hmm. 800, almost 1 trillion. Mm -hmm. We're heading there. That is very frightening because we cannot see an end to it. People usually think it's the middle class yeah. problem that we have where spending is an issue. No. Spending, if you don't know where your money is going, John Allen, we can't have a discussion. Okay. So we found out that for everyone who has generally a regular source of income, mm. the first position that you must take is where does my money go? Mm. Not how much am I earning, not anything else like that. It's when I have cash, where does it go? Mm. Because if I know where it's going, then I can make decisions. But you know, that's, that's actually a, a far deeper and a far scarier question yeah. than, than a lot of people are willing to admit. Yeah. Because sometimes uh, you, you kind of just want to spread the wealth around <laughs> you know, yeah. but I mean, if, if that's the first step, then yeah. fine. I know where my money is going yes. now, right? So yeah. um, I'm spending it on, uh, you know, what have you, books, school, yes. what have you, whatever, whatever expenses I have. Yeah. Um, the economy is still constrained. What right. do I do next? Now you make decisions based on your personal plan and mm -hmm. goals. So many times people will ask this, come on, you guys talk about investment. So what's mm -hmm. the best investment that you're going to have? Mm -hmm. So for those who are taking notes, because I know we're in class almost at this point, mm -hmm. the best investment is the one that matches your goal. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of investments out there. So if you don't know what it's for, then yeah. you can't make a decision. So the idea is set a goal, then out of the multiple investment opportunities that are in front of you, you select the one that best matches the goal that you're aiming for. Okay. For more, not for most, for everyone, mm. there are two major goals you want to have. Mm. Number one is a savings goal. Mm -hmm. When I say savings, I mean having cash available for emergencies mm. or for future investments. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I say an emergency, here's the one that you can measure. Yeah. An emergency for most of us is a lack of income. So, mm. like, especially if you're an employee, but even if you're a business owner, mm. Mm. even if you're a business <laughs> owner, I'm yeah. looking at you, John. Yes, no, me, I'm agreeing with when you. There is, yes. When there are months that business doesn't come in, what yeah. do you do? Mm. So you need to have saved up some cash. So a good measure, what we usually advise guys, is have save up about six months worth of your income for such a rainy day. Okay. Okay. Now, any emergencies come from anywhere. It could be a health emergency. It could be whatever kind of emergency. Yeah. But the one that you can measure is a lack of income. And mm. that's a number you can put. Mm. Now, for most people, from our experience, it would take between three and five years to save up six months of your income. That was so going to be my next question. It, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. it, doesn't, it doesn't just happen like yeah. that. It's going to take a bit of time to get to that point. But you see, because it's a goal, it gives you a target mm. that you're aiming for. Mm. So if you have that target, then you're step by step going towards it. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Yeah. The second one is having an investment mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about investment, this is the one that guys need to hear. And, and from, from our research over the number of years we've been working at Centonomy, yeah. I generally, okay, let's mm -hmm. be very clear because we have to be sensitive now as far as generalizing, right? Yeah. But we find that women tend to save more than men, hmm. but they don't invest sufficiently. What does that mean? So they put money aside. Mm. Now, here's the thing that you need to hear about investment. Investment is putting cash where it will grow faster than inflation. Mm -hmm. Because if your money is in, in an investment that's growing slower than inflation, what's actually happening to the value of the money that you yeah, have? Yeah, it's being eroded. It's being eroded. Yeah. So you want to make sure that as part of your plan, you are, have some investment instruments that are growing faster than inflation All over right. the long term. I, I just want to, to put a pin in that for a second. Please. Tom, if you could do me, do me a favor, 
could you get us what this month's um, inflation um, rate is, mm -hmm. just so that we can have right. like real numbers? Oh, yeah. And then now, because I'm thinking yeah. ballpark, it should be around um, eight to nine percent, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So then, what kind of an investment grows faster than an eight to nine percent growth in inflation or inflationary rate? No problem. Yeah. And I'd advise because you. Look, in, investment is a long-term yeah. discussion. Yeah. So you'd want to look at annualized mm. Um, mm. inflation rates. So you want mm. to look at the last couple of years into this year, what the projection is. Yeah. Don't look at a month to month because mm. too many factors happen there mm -hmm. and you're looking long-term. So look for annualized. Rate. Okay. So um, what investments grow faster than inflation? Mm. Majority of those investments are business-related. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because businesses are generally... Created to generate a profit. And generate income, yes. And, and that's what the idea is to be profitable over time. Mm -hmm. So any investment that's linked to business, will, most investments linked to business will give you rates that are hopefully higher mm -hmm. than inflation. Mm -hmm. So it's either a direct investment or an indirect investment. So you're looking at if you start a business, you're hopefully going to be at mm -hmm. a rate that's de defeating inflation. If you are investing in someone else's business, whether it's directly or through, for instance, the stock market, mm -hmm. you're going to find that over the long term, and here, please, this yes. is the other thing. It's not month to month. Mm. It's not, if I put my investment and think that in the next two months, I'm going to be at that level, no. Yeah. You want to look long term. Mm. When I say long term, I'm saying 10 years. That's mm -hmm. how you want to look. Over a 10-year period, will my investment beat the inflation rate? That's mm -hmm. what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So stock market is a way to go, mm -hmm. whether you're investing directly or you go through what we call unit trusts, yeah. where a unit trust is investing, you have a fund manager who's investing on your behalf. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's one of the areas. People in this country and across Africa love real estate, so yes. we have to talk about it. Yeah. So when we talk about real estate, you think about it this way. It is usually real estate where there is buying and selling of property. Mm -hmm. Then you are able to see that kind of rate of return mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. If you're buying and holding and you're thinking it's the speculative side where you, you yeah. don't know. It's not going to work. <sighs> That's a very strong statement. No, it because may. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it may work, but I mean, look, look at, look at. Yes. I mean, like one of the things, that, and I mean, for full disclosure, I, I did attend a Centonomy class. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I remember very clearly being talked to about was about this um, scenario where there was a guy who invests land, yeah. uh, invests money in yeah. land, thinking that he's going to be able to flip it, yes. you know. And then a stressful emergency situation comes. He's not yes. able to flip the, 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 the land in time. Yeah. In fact, he probably even sold it at a loss based on the value of money at yeah. that point in yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm segueing into a question that I had about misconceptions, yeah. about what to invest in, especially mm -hmm. in a time like this, mm -hmm. right? So inflationary rates are high. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've told us about investing in something that beats the inflationary rate. That's correct. Then... What what are the things that you find are misconceptions? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the example of what you're saying, yeah. which is I'm going to buy land, land always appreciates. Mm. No, mm. that's not true. So in general, land or real estate will appreciate yeah. in value. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing as appreciating in price. Mm. So if you bought it at the... So for, here's the example. The price, the value of the land is here. Let's mm. say it's 100,000 for the piece of land. Yeah. The price that you're getting it is at 150. If I buy it at 150, the actual value is 100. Mm. At the end of the year, the value has increased to 150. Mm. But have I made any money? No. In no. fact, I may even have made a loss over that mm. period of time. So understanding that difference is really important. Mm -hmm. If you can get that right, how do we look at it? The example that you just gave yeah. is to say, the guys who make money in real estate make try as much as possible to make money at the point of purchase. Mm. What does that mean? They're looking for good deals where they're getting the property at less than market value. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So that even at that point, if they were to resell it at market value, they can get it. Mm -hmm. They look for real estate in high demand areas. Yeah. So it means that the price is not going to be 
as easy on the pocket, but it's more it's nearer to the actual value of that property. Yeah. And then they have a strategy on how they are going to sell it. Okay. So the, the thought that most of us Kenyans is I'll buy land. Mm. Yes. See everyone is buying land. I'll yeah. buy. And at some point I'll sell. Mm. You don't know to who, you don't know when, you don't know for how much. Mm. There's no strategy behind it. So when you talk about the myth is yes, the value of the land has appreciated or the property, because it's mm -hmm. not just land, land and buildings. But there's no market for it. Mm -hmm. There's no demand. Mm -hmm. That's where the issue is. So getting into an investment where you do not have a strategy is the problem that people have. How about holding on to money? Because, you know, you're, you're looking at the environment. You're like, gosh, things are bad. Yeah. I need money for a rainy day, right? It's raining right yes. now, right? So yes. my, my default would be, okay, instead of spending, let me hold on to this cash. Is that a misconception? Is that is that ill conceived to be to do that at this point in time, especially if you're thinking about growing it over the long term? So maybe it's good to clarify what do you mean by holding on to cash? As in mattress, mattress bank. Yes. <laughs> no, that's a horrible idea. Okay. Simply because of the security element. Mm. If it's mattress banking, you don't know what could happen. Your children, I mm. could take your cash. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, and and I guess by, by extent, <laughs> digital mattress banking. So you, you put it in your M-Pesa and you just leave it there. Yeah so, yeah. so there's probably a better way to do it. So when mm. you talk about that, it's a good principle. That's why we started. Remember I said saving. Yeah. So saving is putting aside cash for emergency. So mm. that's correct. The mm. idea is correct. So just make sure you're putting it somewhere where it's getting at least some mm. return on it. Mm. You're not... The, here's the thing. You, remember you talked about align your investment to your goal. Yeah. Your goal is, is security, it's there, I can yeah. access, and then access. Mm. So security, it means it's not in my mattress. If it's in yeah. my mattress, somebody could just take it. Mm. If it's in a bank or even using financial services like M-Pesa mm. and their, um, what is it, M-Shwari, so yeah. savings, at least you have some security around that, mm -hmm. okay? And you have access should an emergency come. Yeah. And there's a bit of a return on it. Okay. That's a good goal. Yeah. And that's what we talked about when we said saving. So always with your finances, you have to have a balanced approach. Saving, which means you're preparing for emergencies and things that could come up in the future. Mm -hmm. And investing where you're trying to beat inflation. Right. That's the balanced approach that you want to have. Okay. The problems that we are seeing right now require structural solutions okay give not, me not telling yeah alan reduce what you eat mm. <laughs> why, why am i i'm feeling targeted i'm feeling no, why no, no, no. it's, it's a bubble is... jacket i'm not that heavy. No, I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. as long as someone is still overproducing yeah. and taking from a life support system mm. to produce what you don't need then it doesn't make sense for us to tell you at, as, mm. at an individual capacity to reduce. And isn't that the challenge with the global climate conversation? Yeah. Right? So the mm. people who have industrialized through um, the use of fossil fuels, through highly consumptive and very damaging means to get where they are to the point where they can now fairly easily switch to more sustainable sources of power, sources of energy, more um, sustainable use and conservation of water. All of these guys in the so-called global north, right, are now telling us, um, you guys can't industrialize this way. And here again is the dilemma. I think um, William Ruto, President William Ruto of Kenya was discussing this with um, Mo Ibrahim um, fa fairly recently at, at, at the summit that they had in Nairobi. And Mo Ibrahim gave him a very clear example of what Yoweri Museveni, the president in Uganda, was saying. Why should I stop pumping my oil out of the ground? And until I'm given a solution that actually works for me, I'm going to continue doing this, right? So why should we? We are the ones who are suffering the worst, um, in terms of the worst impacts in terms of climate change, right? And yet we are the ones who don't have the resources to be able to change our fate. Our resources lie in the ground. Our resources sometimes lie in highly consumptive means of being able to extract from, from the environment. We need that money, do we not? So how do, then do we get ourselves out of this situation? Um, that, that's a very good justification. Mm -hmm. um, the energy conversation has lots of 
nuances. Mm. We will not go into that now. Mm. That makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense for Museveni or Ruto to say that mm -hmm. and go ahead and drill the oil and then it is not used in the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and then go ahead and not compensate. I'm, I don't like so many words that are used mm. here in the sector, so but, I'm but gonna say it, a lot of things in Does quotes. it have to be used in a continent as long as we just profit from it? Because the, the, the international architecture is, as mm. long as you're not using it on the continent, you are likely not going to benefit, mm -hmm. or you're going to get very little out of it. Mm -hmm. And you are the one with the resource. You are the one who's going to bear the impact that comes with drilling that resource. Mm -hmm. You're the one who's going to evict people mm -hmm. to put up that resource. So at what expense? Look at Who Qatar, look at the Emiratis. I mean, they've built civilizations out of the desert based on almost purely oil wealth. Look at Norway. It has the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, 1% of, of the world's global stocks, for instance. And world's wealth is you know, held by the, the Norway sovereign fund, which has, is as a result of drilling of fossil fuels, etc., and the exportation of these kinds of resources. So again, I mean, you see, if the market lies out there, you know, does it mean that we have to do that? I, I get the logic that we don't have the infrastructure as yet to be able to do that, and that will be a much longer process. But, you know, if we're exporting oil to places in the world that need it, and we pay, when we receive a premium for, for it, money is money, right? Uh, money is money, but it's not money if the financial system is also not in your favor. Okay. So the same way Norway mm. or the people you've mentioned will be mm -hmm. selling oil is not the same terms mm. Uganda or Kenya will be selling oil. So it's still a shot on the foot, even mm. on that end. Mm. So that's where I'm saying that this conversation globally, locally, nationally, yeah. regionally mm. needs a lot of structural shifts, mm. which the biggest contributors are not willing and even those people you mentioned, they've done those things at the expense of people. They have. Yeah, and, at have. The ex and people, they have not done anything mm. to try and rectify whatever it is they did. Mm. And for those deals to be cut again, that's why I'm saying the energy conversations has lots of things in it that yeah. people don't talk about. When they go into those deals, there are concessions they make and they throw countries and mm. people under the bus. So. Yeah, people need to invest, but at what expense? What's the state of mind of, of some of these people? We found them at the end. Have you been able to talk with some long enough to figure out where they were at the beginning of this mm. process? Mm. Yeah, the state of mind presently is that they have that conviction yeah. and they truly believe that what they're doing is right. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in their mind that, you know, this is a clear pathway to heaven. This is the right way. Mm -hmm. Whatever we are doing, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. So they believe in that. Mm -hmm. uh, to an extent, I remember one individual, we tried to give them medicine because they were not feeling well. And they took the medicine, looked at it and threw it away. And even they, as they're not feeling even well. Even as they're not feeling well. Even as, you know, they're, they're, they've been rescued, they've been removed from that place. We are hosting them in, a, you know, in, in, in some place and they do want to take medicine. Mm. And one of them said, look, I'm an adult male. When we went now to rescue them from the house, he was completely, we couldn't even walk. Yeah. He said, when he was lying down, I'm an adult male. I am conscious. I know what I'm doing. Please leave me alone. Don't take me away from my home. I, am, I know what I am doing. It may not be right to you, but uh, this is my freedom of worship. Mm -hmm. You cannot, you know, uh, interfere with my rights. Mm -hmm. And this is someone who is speaking to you, and you can tell this is not just a village person, someone mm -hmm. intelligent who understands mm -hmm. his rights, who understands what's happening, but has that conviction that, you know, I am doing this, and this is the right way for me mm -hmm. to go. Um, it, we initially even asked when we began because it's a remote place mm. you know 50 60 kilometers from the nearest town malindi mm. and even when you come off the main road you have to go deep inside the forest to get mm. to where you know these places were and so initially we also felt um this guy is preying on 
you know, people who are poverty stricken, mm -hmm. you know, rural folks and stuff like that. But later on, when, you know, now news was coming out of who has been there, you have families from Kisi, people who are educated, you mm -hmm. have people from Kisumu, you have people from, uh, you know, Nairobi, you have people from different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And they all went there. So it wasn't like, these are just people from Kilifi. As we know, Kilifi is uh, one of those uh, counties when there is drought, people actually just die. Mm. You know, poverty levels are very high. It's one of the poorest. We have uh, Bamba area, we, mm. one of the remotest and poorest parts of Kenya. Yeah. But that was not, the, those were not the only victims. Mm. We had good numbers. So the question that everyone is asking, how did he manage to convince mm. an individual like an air hostess, someone who's seen the world, someone who, you know, is well educated, informed about what's happening across the world, mm. to sell off their property, to give all that she had to him, and then up to this point in time has not been seen, which means there's a high probability one of those bodies belongs to her. Yeah. We don't know. But uh, that's a very, very big question. And what we are asking ourselves is, where was the state? Mm. Where was the state when all this was happening? You know, we have chiefs, assistant chiefs. We have Wazewa Mita. We have community policing. Mm -hmm. We have Nyumba Kumi. Every 10 houses, we are supposed to know what is happening. Where we, this, you know, infrastructure, this system, where was it in Shakahola? Mm -hmm. 200 plus bodies. It seemed to have been almost completely, like, secluded or, or you know, either collapsed in that area because... Um, one of the first interviews um, of, you know, the relative of a victim was, you know, detailing his search for his loved one, for yeah. his, his daughter, his son-in-law. And I've had occasion to speak with, you know, members of that family. And they had searched for weeks. They had mm -hmm. talked to the authorities mm -hmm. for weeks, possibly even months. What does this tell you about the reaction time of our local administration? Um, when it comes to things like these, even if it doesn't seem like it might be a major crime, it could be one person missing. But this obviously should, you know, give us all pause for thought, shouldn't it? Two points for me. One is that in Kenya, unless you are a person of substance, mm. if I may call it that, then the authorities don't take your cases seriously. I'm sure if the person who had gone there to report a missing daughter or son-in-law or family was a politician or a wealthy person within the community, mm -hmm. I believe more action would have been taken. Yeah. But because it was just a local teacher, because the, 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 the old man you're referring to is mm -hmm. a local teacher, um, the daughter is just you know another woman within the community. Uh, the son-in-law was a GSU mm. personnel. You know, the police didn't pay much attention. The other issue that uh, comes to mind are stereotypes. Mm -hmm. In that community, the police tell us there's a lot of competition between churches for worshippers, for faithfuls and all that. So they said, uh, you know, we always get these cases. This church is accusing this church of, you know, maligning this other one, mm -hmm. trying to mud sling and stuff like that. So for them, these are things that are reported every day. Some guy from a different church or maybe he's been chased. Yeah. Now he comes and says, oh, these people are doing this and this and this. And for no other reason. But, mm -hmm. you know, they feel jealous or something like that. So when this matter was reported to them, when uh, our officer went to report with this old man, they were, in fact, they told Aki Africa, don't disturb yourselves with these things. These are, you know, people who are that just want to, you know, spoil each other's names. Mm. They said the, that to you, Yes, officer. to our officer. Okay. But then, you know, listening to the old man and, and understanding where he's from and, you know, we, we were not satisfied. So it's at that point then he said, can I go? Can we just escort this man? I was like, how sure are you it's safe? Like, no, 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 from what we hear, they starve people to death. They don't kill people. They don't, are you sure? So we agreed, uh, get a few more men and mm. then, okay, let's go see what happens. So that is when now they went for the first time and the old man was adamant, I'm not living here without my son. You mm. must give me that child. 
And it's at that point now when we got the child, now to report to the police, they realized, oh, okay, this, this is, is not just... Bigger than they thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are improvements in the response mm -hmm. um, from the various institutions as well. There's a lot of talk and discussions and, and reforms around the response and prevention to sexual and gender-based violence across the sectors. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting there slowly. <laughs> in fact, I know that currently the you know, like the National Council on Administration of Justice is looking through the Sexual Offences Act and other related laws just to come around, to, to come up with a more practical way to, to address these issues. Yeah. And so are the others. Um, even the prosecution and the police are, are um, you know, have initiated polycare. They had initiated gender desks, which are solely for the purposes of responding or providing access to justice to survivors of these um, incident. So yeah. there's an increase in the knowledge uh, about the need to improve systems and there's also action being taken mm. to bring about an improvement in, in the different uh, sectors. I think I was in a newsroom when gender desks were first sort of like mm -hmm. rolled out across the country and that was years ago, um, mm. possibly over a decade, um, a decade and a half since. And I've always wondered about their effectiveness. Not so much because I have any, you know, like real knowledge about whether they've they've changed the landscape in terms of reporting of, of sexual and gender-based crimes, but whether really, you know, we have that kind of capacity. Sometimes it feels to me like they were a response to, you know, some political heat that people were facing and the, the police had to do something and mm -hmm. now we have a gender desk. But mm -hmm. what actually has been the impact of gender desks? Yes, I completely understand your perspective. Mm. Um, so gender desks are um, assigned officers specifically to address sexual and gender-based violence and child abuse cases that are reported to them. There have been various schools of thought about the impact. I would really like to see a day when we actually conduct an assessment into this because mm. then we can have solid data that can inform policy. Um, and that's something I hope to see very soon. However, I can add that when I worked in the police surgery, I would interact with these gender desk officers mm -hmm. uh, every day. Actually, if they are not there, then we don't get cases because they can't come on their own. Mm. And so I can tell you that um, you know, if we are seeing 15 cases, 50 cases, 100 cases a day, then there is someone working um, yeah. at the police stations. Um, I also know that a lot of the times they would, the ones I would see frequently um, would be, they're very passionate about what they do. Mm. Very, very passionate. A lot have learned the ropes, um, you know, as they go through their daily routines. So they've learned on the job and they do a lot beyond the call of duty. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I know people don't, don't understand these, you know, sometimes these negative perspectives about the police, but they do, do a lot for, for victims. Um, it's actually amazing to watch. And the fact that cases even get to court means that there are police officers working because yeah. without them, it can't get to court. So mm -hmm. there may be some cracks here and there, but definitely there is work being done. Okay. Um, as for the impact, like I said, we would need to have a study to, to base our, our responses on mm. about that. I want to ask about your own personal experience, what you think the most successful case that engaged, you know, the skill set of people like yourself um, studying in forensic medicine that went from one end to the other. It might be something that you handled, but what do you think is that case that can be a standard bearer for why we need the services of, of um, medical professionals in forensic medicine? Mm, that's a tough one because so many of them are still in court, but mm. I can think of one. <laughs> There's, uh, I think it's the Willie Kimani case. Mm. And it, not, it was not just forensic medicine, but forensic sciences as a whole. Um, there was a lot of, um, you know, I played a role in assessing the murder suspects for their capacity to stand trial. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, there was the forensic pathologist who identified the manner in which um, the victims were, were killed. Mm -hmm. There was the police forensics, which looked into, you know, um, telecommunication, um, DNA analysis of cigarette butts, and, and many other things like that. So that, for me, is a really good case to show, showcase 
the value of forensic science and medicine in um, investigations yeah. and in accessing justice. It's interesting that you mentioned the Widi Kimani case. I mean, we followed it here as well, and we've, mm. we've also reported on the same. And, and it's always stood out to me, yes, as one of those standard bearers for what happens when multiple agencies within you know, the, the, the justice sort of framework in the country work together, right? Mm. Um, and, and I'm not saying this to, to denigrate or to make light of the crimes that were perpetrated against Willie Josphat and Joseph, but it was a fairly high profile case. Yes, it was. How many other cases have walked into your office or have been brought to your desk at the time you were working with the police that merit that kind of, you know, that kind of work rate and that kind of work that just don't get it? I don't think we can even put a figure to it. Um, is that bad? Yes, because, well, the system is overwhelmed. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. There's just too many cases and too few people to do the work. Mm -hmm. It also requires a lot of very good coordination. What you saw there was a well-coordinated case mm -hmm. where everyone knows what it is they're doing. I know in, um, because I've worked with the, you know, when dealing with the dead as well, especially when you have disaster settings, yeah. the crime agencies involved are very well coordinated. You can see how everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing, which brings, basically that's what efficiency is all about. Yeah. But I don't see that when with, it's with the living, living cases, living injured persons, that level of coordination sometimes is missed, not sometimes, many times it's absent because mm. there are too many, too many different institutions that are required. So if I just walk you through our victims, <laughs> life cycle, yeah. um, they will be, uh, maybe this incident has occurred, there's been a rape incident. Then they have to figure out what to do. Who do I tell? Should I tell? Should I not? So let's say a community leader is, is, is informed. Then they have to call someone else probably and say, you need to go to the police station. So they go to a police station, then they're told, okay, did you go to the hospital? You need to go to the hospital first. So if you go to the hospital, get a medical report, get treatment, then go back to the police. Then they get, you know, they do their OB, um, occurrence book number, take your statements, issue a P3 form. You know about the P3 form? Yeah. Um, then it has to go back to another medical person. It's filled out, then it's taken back to the police station. Then it can proceed now to the prosecution and to trial depending on what the prosecutors decide. <laughs> <laughs> now that is now the part of it. I mean, uh, you get a yeah. lot of free time. Yeah, yeah. And as always, me, I've always loved comedic stuff. Yeah. I think if you've looked at my page ever since doing the chicken mm. thing, clacky mm. rubber ducky thing, I think it's something that I've loved doing. And mm. yeah, I think now, now I'm getting to post it. Hey. I always do it under covers, but So, so Kolo the rugby <laughs> star is now Kolo the TikTok uh, star. Uh, should, we, should we wait for a career in, in, in TikTok? I don't know, yeah. um, pretty not sure. Yeah. But yeah, I think I've, I've managed to get a bit of um, some income on social media. Oh, nice. Yeah, because of such things, but uh, yeah. I mean, there are so many, I think there are a couple of options that uh, yeah. I need to just, uh, narrow down and focus on them. I, I want to go back to your retirement. Um, yeah. A lot of us who follow the sport were, were shocked. Of course, we've seen you on the circuit for a long, long time, and, and we all knew that the time was coming. I mean, Tall, your brother Humphrey Kayange, you mm -hmm. know, also a legend of the game, step, you know, stepped away from the game, sad as it was. Yeah. Um, we all knew that the time was coming. Yeah. but. Um, for those of us who, who watched you specifically, we felt like you know you still were fit enough to play at least another three seasons. Yeah. So, is it was it family pressure? What was it that that really led to you saying pulling the trigger and saying okay? Um, I think, like you said, to be honest, um, you are saying three years. Mm. Probably for me, I would say two years. <laughs> um, I think I had a couple of more seasons in me. Mm. Uh, but now I think the, the factors that really contributed to me making the decision were the off, more of the off-field stuff. Mm -hmm. um, by off-field, I mean the team environment changed. Yeah. Um, I, t I think it was, it was time, it was really deteriorating. Um, it was getting a bit toxic. Mm -hmm. And you see, for me, there's never a single day that I used to, I, I woke up and doubted myself. Should I go for training or should I not go for training? Mm -hmm. But I started doing that. 
You see, when you start things like those, you just know there's something somewhere which is very wrong. Something deeper. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, I knew, like you said, I knew time would come and I'd, I'll have to call it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the more the outside staff continued um, pressuring in yeah. and caving in, yeah. which is the team environment was getting toxic, which is family staff, family was growing, mm -hmm. now all the kids are in school. Mm -hmm. You still have to think of how you're gonna provide, how you're gonna stick with them. Mm, because the social media millions are not actual millions. Exactly, yeah. but then again now, I just had to make a decision and decide what I need to do. And yeah, that's how, that's how it came about. You know, you know we're having this conversation in the shadow of perhaps one of the most difficult times in rugby. Yeah. Um, Kenya Seven's team has just been relegated. It, it's lost its core status after 20 years yeah that and it was 20 and before the 20 years what i think people forget was just how hard won that status was for yeah. us to become a core team yeah. um you know um, for all of this time and all of the legendary players that have supported and, and brought kenya to where it was supposed to be um it was an incredibly sad time yeah i mean yeah. It's, it's it's a very sad time like you said like being in the circuit for i think it's even more than 20 years mm -hmm. Because uh, I joined the, the team, I think, in 2006, seven somewhere there. Mm. And it, the team was already a core team. Yeah. So you can imagine those guys who started it off and now seeing it being relegated last mm. year. I think it's, it was very painful. Yeah. And I remember I had a conversation with Newton the other, just the other mm. day. I don't know if you remember yeah, Newton. Yeah, yeah, yeah Newton on Allo, yeah. New T. I mean, yeah. he was very sad. He actually couldn't believe it. At some point, everyone was thinking about Benja saying, mm. may his soul rest in peace, how it was a sad day. The day that we get relegated is the it's day the actually second Benja, anniversary yeah, of, his death. of his death. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, I think um, when I mentioned team environment getting toxic, I think the team was a very, on a very upward trajectory. Mm. As you know, since our days when you're playing, mm. uh, the allowances were being paid. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, Guys, it was, yeah, wouldn't believe, but anyway. it was getting, it came getting upwards and yeah. upwards till at a time, like I told you, I think around 2013 there, yeah. we were now turning into a bit of professional environment mm. where a player, you could just wake up and play rugby mm. and go back home and still earn a very good living and mm. a comfortable living. And it reached 2016, things were still okay. And I think that was the time we had reached picked. Yeah. We had picked, the team already picked. And it was our pick. I mean, if you look at the development from 2013, yeah. 2014, 2015, having, uh, having Paul True coming as a coach. Now 2016, I think is when now, by the then coach Benja, who had, were starting to reap the, the effects the of all those yeah. years. But then again, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't want to point fingers, but now things just started dropping. Yeah. Now our contracts suddenly were being slashed. Um, every year you renew your contract, the amount depreciates, mm. the allowances are being slashed. I mean, it was just everything around player welfare. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the reasoning behind it, it was very sickening. Yeah. If you hear what were reason, the reasons? Let me just give one. Mm. Um, and I won't be afraid to say, because you know me, I always speak out. Mm. I, I think uh, one of, I'll just give you one reason which Personally, I found it very bad because one of the directors at that time say that uh, there is no way a player can be paying this kind of money and he just left high school. I have a degree in biochemistry. <laughs> so, so <laughs> pardon me for asking, but how does a biochemist make that jump from biochemistry into makeup? makeup. Is, it, is, is there anything in biochem that then you applied? Or is it just a matter of interest? No, it's just interest. I've always been artistic, so mm -hmm. I love anything that involves art. So when I started watching those YouTube videos and it's, you know, it's artistic, makeup mm -hmm. is just drawing those lines. Mm -hmm. I got that interest and it was easy for me to pick it up. Yeah. I didn't struggle as much. So I just watched a video, oh, you did lashes like that, I do it and I got it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, ah, let me just keep doing this. <laughs> But yeah. what did lead you to, to the study of biochemistry, if I can just dig in there a little Honestly, bit? Honestly, mm. it's those job admissions where you, oh. you just find where, where you land. Yeah. You just go, you land. You know, they say the degree is sometimes for the parents. Uh. <laughs> I was 
that's one of those. Okay. So at least mzazi mempeleka degree. Yeah, I'm part of the degree yake so at least I'm doing what I love. Yeah. I'm passionate about it. Yeah. And now they have nothing to say. At least they have their degree. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. never in a day have you worked in a laboratory. <laughs> I haven't. Okay. Yeah. Just a laboratory but with people's faces. When you were in school. Yeah. So you know that kind internship you mm-hmm. have, I went to Kemri. Mm-hmm. You know those ones you have to do but yes. afterwards I didn't feel like that is something I wanted to do. Mm. So I'm happy that I f- discovered makeup. Now, to the more traditional parent, they'll be like you're spending your days drawing on people's faces and you call it a car- I don't know why I feel like <laughs> doing a Nigerian accent here because they're the ones who are usually very forceful. But so you know even our, our own Kenyan parents do that as well. So yeah. what do you mean your 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 drawing on people's faces and you're calling that a career? Did you have that discussion with your folks? Mm, my dad mm-hmm. was very supportive because he also loves anything artistic. So I used mm-hmm. to draw those things when I was in school and he used to even take them and stick them on our walls. Mm-hmm. So when I picked up makeup, he actually was my first like investor. He boosted, he invested in my oh, nice. products, yeah. yeah, my kits. Mm-hmm. He he was very open mm-hmm. in me doing makeup. Oh, well, that's good. That's that's I good. Was lucky, and actually. and yes, yes, rare for because there are some people who might not understand the choice, especially the leap. But it is it kind of leans into something that um, a lot of young people are are thinking about today. So yeah. generations past, and I think even with if I can call it my generation, mm-hmm. millennials, etc. Yeah, um, it was more about you know getting to a profession, etc. You know, do something that that matters. Yeah. Um, in in name be mm-hmm. a lawyer mm-hmm. be a doctor mm-hmm. be this be that the title was important yeah but then there's this discussion about purpose that i find that young people are mm-hmm. having increasingly More. Yeah. um today than than they they did in the past yeah what to you was you know that discussion either with yourself or with other people about finding your purpose in this profession um i i can't say anything in particular i feel like I was just doing something I enjoy doing mm-hmm. then in the process of doing it I found that I'm living through it mm. I enjoy doing it I'm tra- I'm making people happy and that that feeling that they get afterwards mm-hmm. makes me feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do That's very interesting yeah. again um something that other so another guest was talking about here yeah. in terms of the emptiness he felt as an athlete mm-hmm. after winning what have you Okay. But the moment he started doing things for other people, yeah. the feeling that he got mm. in return was something that then now boosts him. Yes. And, and as and he ha- he people. also happens to be a content creator online. Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. You, you might know him. Uh, <laughs> you can see the brag, but we have very good hey. interesting guests. <laughs> Which brings me very nicely into my next question about one particular video that went across the world. Mm-hmm. I watched it and I was really touched. It started like every other video where yeah. you would cook and that sort of thing yeah, and then yeah. you went and started packing the food and at the end of the day you were you were handing it out to uh-huh. to people who are living on the street. Um beyond your passion, right? Is there anything that connected with you um that drove you to do that video anything from your past or anything that you just felt yeah really, yeah that yeah. that video as um as a as a long long backstory people just mm. see the cooking and me giving out uh, food to the to the street kids yeah it's something i used to do you know uh, me and my friends but most of the time alone like once in a while i give mm. it to the the kids on the streets and it comes from like when i was in high school i was in kisi high school mm. um I was bullied a lot while I was in high school. So there was a time I was like I've had enough. Let me run away from from school. So I ran away from school uh, and then you know African uh, family I was like I also don't want to go home. Mm. Uh like I'm fed up. I, I want to live life on my own. Mm. So I I was in Kisi at 500 shillings. 400 shillings I think was it was around 350. Mm. Was my transport from Kisi to Nairobi. So I came to Nairobi uh ate the, the the money that was left over the first day I was already broke. Oh. So I was and, and I I lived in the streets of Nairobi for seven to to eight days before they actually sent a search party to, to find me. So at some pi- point in my life I was a street kid so and I made lots of good friends uh in the streets like we used to to survive and it was pretty cold because it was around 
July, August, August, somewhere there. Yeah. It was pretty cold. So, mm. like, when it, at night, we used to go, like, uh, these buses that come from up country. Like, mm. when the exhaust is still running, you just go s chill next to it for, like, 30 minutes to an hour. And then it, 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 it keeps you warm. When it's mm. time to eat, there were lorries that were coming from Tanzania. They used to park in Marikiti somewhere. So, mm used to go sleep under there and then in the middle of the night when the drivers are all asleep, you jump up, open the canvas, mm. steal a few fruits. Yeah, and that's how we used, to, we used to survive until a friend of mine who was a street kid who told me, most of us who are here, we actually don't have families. Mm. You, you have a, a, a family. family. I was like, yeah, but you know, I'm already too deep into this. This mm. is day eight. I don't know how to call or what to say once I call. Mm. Like, I also want to go home. Um, this life is tough. Yeah. <laughs> this life is tough because yeah. we used to go shower in Nairobi, Nairobi River, not even wow. shower, just wash our feet and stuff. So he was like, just give me a, a contact of someone I can, I can reach mm. or, or just give me your dad's number. So I gave him my dad's number. I was like, I don't have money. That time, we still had these mm, the uh, coin boxes. The, the coin boxes. Mm. So I went to the coin box, called my dad. I don't know what they discussed. They were there for, um, for a while. Actually, he didn't call. He called, and then the five shillings was, was up, uh, over, and then my dad called back. Mm. So they talked for quite some time, and then he came back. He told me, okay, I've told your dad. I asked him, what did he say? He said, uh, you need to go home. And then I was like, I want to go home, but I don't want to go home. You know, mm. there's also that fear coming from an African yeah. family. You know, you know, your dad is going to deal with you ruthlessly. Yeah, yeah. I was like, let us just wait it off for a, a while. Uh, but my dad had sent a search party now in, mm. in Nairobi. So there's this one time now we had gone, the sun was up, so we had gone now to Nairobi River, sort of just chill, wash our face, our hands a bit. And then as we were going down there, I saw my uncle coming up. Mm. I wanted to run, but something, I was already tired. I was like, ah, just save me, <laughs> take me home. So yeah. immediately he took me to some chips um, and chicken joint. I had food for a proper meal uh, in a long time. Went home, had a long shower, and then my dad uh, sort of took me back, took me back to school. And so mm. from that day onwards, I have a soft spot for homeless people and mm. especially street children because I made lots of friends like I, I even I even forgotten I the entire eight days I was, I was there I never knew his name he never knew my name wow but we sort of just connected together we were, yeah. we were like a band of brothers and yeah I'm, I'm, I'm glad I I survived mm. yeah. and that experience I mean must have informed it it, it it showed in that in the video yeah. because I mean I watch a lot of your videos as well and interesting as they are I always enjoy a video that has a story yeah. and I always wondered about okay so what would drive you to do that and that I'm glad that you've answered the question and that's a very surprising interesting. that's the video yeah uh, that my first video that actually went viral yeah. I never expected it to go viral because it's something I was doing and then I was like, okay, mm. this time I have time. Yeah. Let me record everything. But, you know, they just plonk a camera in front of mm. you and you just act the way you act on a daily basis, yeah. right? But the, the scripting, the storylining, the selection of characters, mm. all of these things that you've mentioned is very, very deliberate, mm. right? Mm. So I guess for, for someone who'd be watching this and, and, and wondering to themselves, you know, what's real and what's fake? Mm. on the show or yeah. what's real and maybe fake is a bit too harsh what's scripted on the show so nothing is scripted on the show except perhaps for voiceovers you know next week on mm. <laughs> those we might mm. write uh, but for the most part nothing is scripted so yeah. what you call what you call it is guided or directed reality yeah uh, and and how that works is you basically map out uh, the cast members and you say, you know, we think so and so has this story that could be pursued mm. and this is how it's connected to uh, another person and you sort of almost map out the, what you consider the journey that will be for every cast member. Yeah. And so the first trick, of course, is how you pair, how you, you, you put together this group of people, mm -hmm. how you select them. There's, there's certain traits you look for. They, yeah. they must be very expressive. Mm. So if you notice a lot of our cast members mm -hmm. can, can really tell you what they think. Yeah. They're expressive. They are, um, they've got uh, colorful personalities. Mm. Uh, they're interesting people. Like they're, they're leading actual interesting lives. Yeah. Uh, they like to dress up and, mm -hmm. and, and show up. They, um, they've got 
you know, intricacies about them. They also, the, the cast members tend to not be very young. Yeah. So they're also quite experienced. Mm. Uh, no, no, they, they've lived a life. That, mm. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. So that they've got a mm. background, they've got friends around them. Yeah. Um, they've done some miles, like yes. in this journey of ours. Yes, life. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, they've got, they've got li- lived experience. I think mm. that's what it's called. Mm. Um, it also helps in some cases where you have celebrities like Vera, mm-hmm. uh, so that, you know, the audience already has some familiarity to who she is. You yeah. have someone like Mine, who's also an actress. Mm. Um, so how you select the group of people and sort of how you imagine the storylines uh, that are available. Yeah. But then once you you do that mapping, which is very theoretical, mm. and once you put these people together, assuming they agree to it, uh, it then takes a life of its own. I want to, I want <laughs> us to go there. What was the most surprising or shocking thing that you watched on the show and you were like, Allah, we thought that this would work this way. We thought that these guys would have this chemistry. But uh, it looks like um, they're, they're not having the right kind of chemistry or we thought that this wouldn't work, this aspect of the show might be something that people wouldn't pay attention to. Mm-hmm. That's attracted a lot of attention. Uh, I think so. So two things. We've been surprised by both the cast members yeah. and the audience. Mm-hmm. So there's episodes that I considered a bit slow. Yeah. Uh, you know, where there wasn't much drama, I think, especially towards the season. Mm. Um, and, you know, you sit down and, and say, you know, like, hey, we don't think these ones will do very well. But then you go on the, on the comments online and you find that mm. the audience loved it when the, when the, when the cast were fighting. Mm. But they loved it even more when they were making peace, mm. which goes against yeah. what you think the show is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, at the beginning we had, uh, we had the episodes that began and you, you had some... Uh, some drama between some cast members. You yeah. know, you had uh, Mine and, and, and Susan. Mm-hmm. You had Vera and Sonal. Mm. Uh, and people cheered those on. Yeah. But then they celebrated more when they made friends. Mm. And if you look at even the comments from across the continent, yeah. part of the uh, the praise that the, the season one is getting is that uh, Real Housewives of Nairobi takes you deeper beyond uh, mm. the conflicts. Mm. So they take you into what uh, Dr. Catherine does for a living yeah. and her attempt to, um, to, uh, to hold Mine's hand business-wise. Mm-hmm. They love uh, how we've showcased the city. Mm. Uh, so a lot of those things, you know, initially you think like, oh, let's get drama, let's get drama. Yeah. And then the audience also wants peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some, some of that stuff All is... All want is, different is, things from the... Yes. And, and that's the interesting thing about this show you mm. would assume that and you know i i want to use like a somewhat um, demeaning euphemism for these kinds of this kind of genre you'd assume that trash tv in a sense mm. is a sort of thing that only a specific kind of person watches mm. Mm. but what's been surprising to me is how well known the show is yes. across genres mm. uh, across genders mm-hmm. across people who have assumed sort of like likes in terms of genres yes what does this reveal to you about our audience now especially with this kind of a show it's a very out there mm. show right mm. so and and also maybe like a step forward from what you've done in the past in terms of the reality stuff that you've done. Yeah. What surprised you most about the audience? Um, I think so. F- first of all, we, we we have a long history of reality TV mm. in, in in Kenya before we got to uh, to Real Housewives. Yeah. Uh, the the initial bit about it was we the first show we did was called Bing Bahati, mm-hmm. uh, which was our first celebrity. It wasn't it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the first celebrity reality show in Kenya, I think, because there had mm. been Nairobi Diaries mm. um, and maybe one other, but it was amongst the the, the first yeah. three at the at the, at the at the very most. Yeah. Um, and when we did that, it was on NTV, uh, and it was you know it, it's what uh, it, it it brought the Bahati's personal life with with his wife Diana mm. to the forefront. And I remember at the time uh, we, were, we were watching the, the reviews of the broadcasters and it was surprising as hell because on one hand, the numbers are so good, but mm. the sentiments are not. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's the notion of hate watching uh, mm. uh, where people show up week on week to mm. say how much they hate something. Yeah. But even the stuff that they're commenting on is minutes 24 just before the show ends. Mm. So it tells you they are watching it. They've gone every through week, the entire, every week. The, the yeah. entire and, show. And they're doing this every week. Mm. And that was just like extremely confusing yeah. because clearly you love this thing. Mm. Otherwise you wouldn't be consuming it as much as you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. COVID-19 came and changed our lives in many ways. I mean, True. I, I think, you know, Anybody whose life hasn't been changed yeah, in yeah. some way, perhaps, you know, was asleep through that time. Definitely, period. definitely. Um, and the assumption would have been, <coughs> especially for non-essential surgeries. Yes. Um, and I'm talking now about the non-essential part yeah, of yeah, plastic yeah. surgery. Yes. Um, the luxury that, part. Yes, the luxury <laughs> part. That, that, um, that this would have killed off your business. That's true. Did it or was there 
you know, because I've been reading a little bit about what's been happening around the world. Yeah. Did it kill off your 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 industry? Funny enough, no. Mm-hmm. Actually, it shut up. Mm. Yes. So then you guys uh, are tracking with the rest of the world. Yes. Yeah. It was very interesting because <clears throat> now ma- there were so many people who wanted to get their treatments. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the bigger issues is because everyone was secluded. So, mm. of course, people don't usually want to talk about it. So, yeah. it, it worked very well in, in terms of recovery. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, of course, you're secluded like, because of re- yeah, you, you're, you're secluded you're... so you can have your recovery quietly. Yeah. No one will come. You know, that's. You're coming for a procedure, everyone will want to come and mm. stuff like that. So all of the COVID, some of and the COVID then, bodies that we saw were, were, were created on your table. Is that that uh, safe to us? The hands are here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yeah. yes, that's true. And then uh, also the thing about not going to work, you can work from anywhere. Because mm. most of our surgeries, <clears throat> mm, you can work. Mm. Like even the next day, it's just that you can't go to work. Yes. You get. Mm. So that working remotely also made many people like someone would be in, from Kakamega would be in Nairobi yeah. and recovering then, yeah. and working and I no one knows what happened knows. yeah another trend that i noticed um they call it at least what you know the, the reports that i was i was reading you yeah. know, colloquially referred to part of the the boom in in, yes. uh, in in plastic surgery as the zoom boom where because people are on zoom so much yes. and they're looking at images of themselves yes then they started to recognize well actually yeah, i do need some work here and there was that yes. an experience for you um well for us ideally africans we age well mm. so it wasn't such a big deal mm-hmm. unless for the caucasians and probably asians yeah. yes that was a big deal and that's why maybe the non-injectable the injectable the injectables. non-surgical plastic surgery yeah yeah botox fillers mm-hmm. so yeah and the tiktok also the tiktok face such stuff interesting yes so filters so, <coughs> on tiktok yes possibly instagram have yeah. been influencing very driving towards your business of course Right. Yes, yes, yes. But does uh, does no. anybody ever come to you like you know with um, with their phone and they'll be like, look, look at this filter. I want to look like this. Yeah, they uh, and since as I said, yeah, yeah, Africans we age gracefully, mm. uh, like wine. But mm. anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. but that's part of the the skin types. There are mm. six skin types. So our skin type ages well slowly mm-hmm. but now the problem is the healing scars mm. scars are bad for us ah. so for us most of our work facial work is less compared to to caucasians, caucasians and, and, and people and, uh, of other races Asians. yes the darker skin face we are usually like if you look at your peer yeah. a caucasian you'll definitely think they'll probably be looking at a facelift mm. yes but for us our skin is good until you're 70. so there's actually science <laughs> behind the saying black yeah. don't crack true mm. actually <laughs> i don't even have to find the news the news finds me yeah so that's value so am i getting value for my money if i'm for example paying a subscription mm. or i'm paying for tv is the news that I'm watching of value to me? And we're going to come to the mm-hmm. issue of news avoidance. And I like that we're going to be discussing that yeah. because that is a significant game changer in the media. Then secondly, is value for advertisers. Mm. And this is where the money is because advertisers have realized that there are options now mm. with digital, What obviously what we've discussed. They want to know if I pay um, $4,000 or $5,000 for a full page mm. um, in a newspaper ad. We want to see conversions. We want to see people actually responding to our products and services. But it's kind of difficult mm. if you're doing that on newspaper. So they do their math and they say, if we did that on digital, we are able to even get instant feedback from mm. our you know, our customers and our clients. And then the third thing is also value to shareholders. Mm. Remember that some of the largest news media organizations in East Africa are publicly listed. And, you know, this is about shareholders. Um, And, you know, know, whether we like it or not, the leaders of these media organizations have to maximize shareholder value. Mm. They have to give their shareholders 
what is in it for them. You know, for every investment, in, uh, shareholders are going to ask them, what is going to ask? So how does this affect the top line mm -hmm. and the bottom line? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you, so, I mean, you understand how the media is, you know, multifaceted yeah. in the sense that, you know, when you talk about value. Now, coming back to the question on Githeri Media. Mm -hmm. Because it's also, it also implies a value <coughs> discussion there. Precisely. Yeah. So, the question around Githeri Media, first of all, I need to ask, who is calling the media Githeri, Githeri Media? media. Because mm -hmm. if the media is not telling the story, giving the side of the story that you like, you're mm -hmm. going to call it Githeri Media. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this, that some of the most dedicated and talented and committed journalists mm. in Africa, in this continent, are seated in Kenyan newsrooms. Mm. It's easy to criticize the media and the journalists when you're not in the newsroom, when mm. you don't understand what it takes yeah. to bring a good story to you. We always accuse editors and journalists of corruption and, and, and all that. Mm without realizing that a lot of them are putting their lives on the line to bring that story. Mm -hmm. But also, this is also a wake-up call to the media because we've also seen some, you know, lack of professionalism mm -hmm. in the media. Um, I'm not, you're not, of course, naming names and, and that kind of thing. But also, you know, I think Gidari Media is signaling um, to Kenyan journalists, Kenyan media, mm -hmm. that the audiences want more. Mm -hmm. You know, they want, you know, um, beyond the he said, she said kind of journalism. Yeah. They want you to go a layer deeper, you know. Mm. Um, because what we are seeing right now is that a lot, of gen a lot of media right now is a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm. So there's no, a mile wide, inch deep. So I, like, I like that analogy. Yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. So there's, you know, they're covering so many things, but without depth. depth. And I think what the audiences are signaling to the media is that, look, go beyond the breaking news. Mm. Go beyond um, who won the elections. Tell us why they won and how they won.